social media, it defines the world we live in, or is it the root of all evil, according to some? We decided to go to the source, to Tara Hunt. She is a Saskatchewan girl, of course, where all smart people come from. Graduated from the University of Calgary in cultural studies and critical theory, she was actually one of the first people in the social media marketing business, wrote one of the first books on how the web is changing business, The Woofy Factor, and has been working in this field ever since. It's really, really nice to meet you, Tara. Thanks for agreeing to be here. Thank you so much for having me, Pamela. So, or should I call you Senator Wallen? No, no, you should call me Pamela. <laughs> I think that's exactly how we'll, uh, we'll deal here. So you have said a lot of things that uh, intrigue me, and this is one of the things that I have always practiced in my own life when I was in the world of journalism, is that listening is the ability to be changed by the other. If we just shut up and listen, we can figure out what are the things we have to deal with in the world. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that's what drew me to social media in the first place was the ability to learn all sorts of new perspectives and experiences from people all over the world with different experiences. And um, that's why I fell in love with it in the first place. How did you see it at the beginning when people weren't seeing it? How did you start writing about it and building this? Yeah, so I started being involved in online communities. This is before the term social media was a term ever coined. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I started being involved in online communities in the 90s, before there was a browser, actually. Mm -hmm. Before uh, there wasn't even an internet browser, I was on uh, Usenet groups. I'm not sure if uh, that's dating me or not, but uh, you know these very, very old forums that you logged into, um, you know, with a dial-up modem, and they were very slow. And um, you know, it was fascinating, though, to me who I was meeting and connecting with around the world. And um, I've always been really into technology thanks to my father who uh um who was also very fascinated with technology and so i i was there i was actually a very i was a young mother mm -hmm. um and feeling kind of isolated and uh, got set up with a modem because i heard about this this whole dial-up thing. I'll just um, tell you, that's how we used to do journalism in the old days, too. It was yeah. pretty rudimentary. <laughs> yeah, and I would log on when, when my baby was sleeping, and uh, I would meet all sorts of interesting people and feel really great support. And so for me, early on, I saw this potential, I guess, <clears throat> in this uh, online world where... You could connect with other people. You could learn things from other people. You didn't have to leave your house, um, which is very relevant for today, of course. Exactly. Um, but but you, you could meet all these other people and get support from them and learn from them. And as a young mother, I had so many questions, um, as well as my career aspirations at the time. I didn't know what I wanted to do. This was even before I went back to, uh, went to university. So... Uh, you know, like I saw this potential when I was in university, I started taking cultural studies. I was really drawn to uh, the online world. There were lots of arguments even then that the digital world, the online world would create divisions, mm -hmm. um, would also, was also... Um, Amplified difference. Yeah, yeah. And it was also, there was a concern that it would um, isolate us even right. more. There was a concern about the loss of, of our interactions and social capital. Uh, even at the time, I think Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, yes, you know, really talked absolutely. about this. But I was convinced, um, I guess, as a little bit of a somebody who had experienced it firsthand and found it was super helpful. I was convinced that it was actually going to be what. Well, at the time, I believed it was going to bring us out of these, these, dif these uh, divisions and teach us about one another. And so when I graduated, 
Uh, I actually, it wasn't natural for me to think, oh, well, I'm going to go into marketing. I'm going to apply what I know about social media or about uh, this online communities. Um, but when I graduated, I did go into marketing, uh, cultural studies, naturally dovetailed into that. And more and more, I found myself becoming an advocate for these online digital spaces. And, and I came across a book called uh, the Clue Train Manifesto very early on. It was uh, published late 90s. And uh, the, there was like 99 core theses as all good 90s books had, you know, manifesto theses. Of <laughs> course they did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the first uh, thesis was um, markets are conversations. And in essence, what it meant is like people are talking and that's how that's how we find out about products to buy and that's how we find out um about things to try and and new solutions and that you know that these conversations were happening and they used to happen in physical markets and they're happening more and more online and life uh, is about conver life is conversations that's what it is <laughs> absolutely and in marketing you know the the longest running adage is word of mouth is mm -hmm. the best form of marketing is the strongest form of marketing. And it was translating more and more online. Of course, it was more of a niche audience at that time. Uh, but I saw the potential for it to grow. I saw more and more people getting online. One of the um, things online. that you say, and I think it's so important, is that self-expression, which is is what the the social media world is about, does not mean self-promotion when you start to use it as self-promotion it undermines the original mandate yeah well it becomes in it becomes what social media has become today which i think is why we're fueling the divisions mm -hmm. is a shouting match mm -hmm. right like it instead of being i think our original metaphor for twitter and platforms like twitter even facebook etc were it was our worldwide water cooler is, is mm -hmm. how we talked about it, where we would come together to, to have a conversation um, and learn from one another and like listen, do a lot of listening and responding and these conversations would build. However, somewhere along the way, this shifted and all of a sudden becoming a influencer or, you know, using, leveraging these platforms to get the word out became more of the practice than just going to check in and in, in that in that water cooler to see what people are talking about. So what's your sense of it today as you look at it for, I mean, more than 20 years you've been in this field. Are we where we should be or is it concerning to you? It's completely uh, broken and I don't, some days I worry it's broken beyond repair. Uh, mm -hmm. it is no longer social. Like when people say social media, I say, well, that's not social media. Social media was what was happening back in those Usenet groups. Social media what was, is what was happening um, in the early days of Twitter before there were retweets and like buttons and follower accounts. You know, social media. I'm so glad to hear you say this. <laughs> I think it's a conversation we have to have. Yeah, absolutely. Social media was long before influencers became mm -hmm. the hot topic of the day. Um, and, and really it was, you know, social media was what brought, what was bringing us together. There were early, beautiful early examples um, in the lifetime of social media and especially around Twitter where, you know, it was social media was used to connect with others and amplify amplify voices that were previously um uh, you know they, they, unheard they were, or marginal yeah, exactly. or yeah thank you yeah so the green revolution for instance uh was probably an, a beautiful early example of you know how people could organize find one another get support from one another to uh, over, you know, to break through and overcome um, years of oppression and uh, lack of communication. Um, there were some, Calif you know, we're also dealing with wildfires right now, again, in California. But right. I, I remember, I think it was in 2007, that um, 
one, you know, wildfires were raging in California and people were using Twitter to share information on where people could get shelter, where they could get water, where like the fire was like being put out and where they could, when they could return safely to their homes, you know, those were days of or the Arab spring. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So all of this, you know, all these early examples, I mean, that, that created, that fueled a lot of hope in me. And I saw this as a look at humanity. I was such a digital utopian. (laughs) (laughs) Look at how humanity can come together to solve issues with one another and break through our differences. Um, But there were, there was a turning point that, and the turning point um, really started to happen when, I mean, um, not to, wag too many fingers but when celebrity was starting to get involved uh in social media i remember uh when i think it was ash and kutchner uh joined twitter um back in the day and all of a sudden that's what all the buzz was about. no that's and a they- really good point it's just it's exactly it's it's become their self-marketing machine as well yeah. Yeah. And, and, and great. What, what it would, that does do is create a level of accessibility to mm-hmm. the audience and brings them a little bit more to a human level, which I think is a positive thing. But the, when you bring celebrity and when you bring this idea of influencers onto these platforms and you make it about like a competition to who has the most follows and retweets and likes and can get the most attention we end up with and i don't don't know how political you want to get with but we end up with donald trump <laughs> you know basically well and we also anyway. end up with the cancel culture where people's lives can be brought to a screeching halt uh, because somebody has made an accusation on twitter that has no basis in law or sometimes even fact well and you know some can like i would argue that um, some of cancel culture is accountability making. Mm-hmm. However, um, who are we in the uh, court of the people <laughs> to make that judgment, right? Like nobody gets a due process in that. On Twitter. Uh, cancellation, yeah. Yeah, so accountability is important, but this isn't the way to execute it. <laughs> no, this is this is so interesting. I want to go for a moment into, but you are doing social media marketing. Um, that's uh, and and I read what you said the other day, which or recently, which I thought was very interesting. What if we thought of 2020, which everybody is thinking it's the end of the world as we know it, and what does COVID mean, and how long will it last? But what if we thought of 2020? as an accelerator more than a disruptor, because people do tend to see it as, as, as a disruptor. What do you mean by that? Well, um, what we've seen happen um, in a lot of cases. So let's, let's drill down to business, for mm-hmm. instance. Um, a lot of businesses, especially small and mid-sized businesses are being devastated right now. That is not a positive thing at all. Um, and it is, you know, happening at a rate of acceleration that we don't even understand quite yet. And I think the follow-up from this is going to uh, happen for quite a while. And, um, you know, this we're not going to be out of the woods anytime soon. Yeah. H- however, um, a lot of the businesses that are pulling through, um, and this was part of an article that I wrote, Um, A lot of businesses that are pulling through this and actually coming out the other side really positively are businesses who they knew that they needed to make a sort of a have sort of some sort of digital transformation in their business model and create flexibility. And so very early on in the pandemic, they said, "Okay, I've done the research. I've been sort of holding off on this. It's time for me to make a change. And they took that time to really focus on adjusting their business or diving into some area where they can actually provide value through digital channels. So one of the examples that I gave uh, is a um, eyeglass designer friend that I have who went directly, she was basically selling directly to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
ophthalmologist offices, right? Um, and of course, all of these were being shut down. And she had thought for a long time about going direct to consumer with her mm -hmm. glasses um, and had done the research. But like everything was going so well for her before that she just kept kind of putting it off for a rainy day. Well, rainy day was here. All of a sudden her sales dried up and she had she had some more time on her hands. And she took that time and that moment to really focus on creating a direct-to-consumer model for her business. And uh, from what I understand, her business is actually going to bring in more money in this year, in 2020, than it did in previous years when she was selling through um you know, indirectly through these uh, optometrists. So on the flip side of that then is you've got fashion brands who have <clears throat> jumped on the COVID bandwagon to design masks or, um, you know, groovy alcohol labels that are making hand sanitizer. That That's all good. And it may even be socially responsible, uh, but it's not great for the bottom line. If you're selling a $2,000 purse and now you're selling a $19 mask, uh, somewhere you're losing money. Yeah, well, absolutely. And there's going to be have to be more than a response to the pandemic in mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen in fashion brands, uh, of course, there is no doubt about like how fashion brands are probably going to come out the other end of this very scorched. Um, and that is not a good thing. Um, you know, I had to I had to go to the mall the other day to to pick up something that was unavailable online. And I walked through uh, the, I don't know if you know about the third floor of the Bay. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> like indeed. Where all, the, where all the high end brands are. I love walking through there just to like dream. Well, the sales, <laughs> the yeah. sales there, if you wanted to take advantage of the, the, um, the absolute devastation for these uh, designers, it is uh, the time now not to say you should, um, although they probably do. No, need but that is what happens. Your two thousand yeah. dollar dress is one hundred and eleven dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that that's definitely uh, going to ha going to happen. But I also do see some smart brands um, in Canadian brands, too, um, who are switching up the like the capsules, I guess they're doing. So instead of the um i guess the uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of it like the the capsule that you would create for a co for like uh cottage country or mm -hmm. or uh, vacationing it's more like an athleisure kind of work from home yes. wear where yes it's still it's comfortable but stylish enough to look good on zoom yes at least um, from the waist up yeah yeah exactly <laughs> um and you know there are there's definitely uh some of that there's um you know, I bought a two hundred dollar mask from a Canadian designer. Um, I know, um, <laughs> no judge, but like one, you know, I wanted to support them for one, and you know, they d donated um, half of those proceeds to uh, frontline workers. And um, but you know, like it's now it's my famous, it's my fabulous Narcisse mask, um, which is a designer mask. So there's yeah. there's opportunities, I think, even in that business we still need we're going to still need clothes um you know it's just a different type of um fashion i guess but do, but do you think that our expectations have fundamentally changed i was sitting on a plane recently talking with one of the flight attendants who said to me well you're old enough to remember and i'm old enough to remember that this is how planes used to be they were clean. They cleaned them after every flight. They weren't doing a turnaround. Our expectation of, um, you know, just safety and sanitization and spatial awareness and all, you know, keeping your distance. Are people really going to get on planes and be crammed in and on subways and be crammed in and shake hands and hug? Or is it too early to tell whether some of the impacts of COVID will now reawaken in us what life used to be when there were fewer people and fewer issues yeah i mean okay things are going to change we don't know exactly how much they're going to change or how long the impact of what what we're seeing is going to resonate however um 
some of these changes, I would say, are positive. Mm-hmm. Yes, we should be cleaning planes um, and the public transit and the public spaces and keeping you know things more sanitary in general anyway we should have been doing that beforehand um there is you know we have flu seasons even without covid every year that are devastating to all sorts of populations already uh the transmission um often happens in these uh public transportation p- places so okay this is a wake up call let's let's continue that practice cramming us into airplanes um you know we there's there are a lot, a lot of parts of our economy that are fundamentally broken, and um, this could be an opportunity to rethink this uh, as well. Um, you know, Canadian um, thought leader Naomi Klein has talked about this a lot. You know, where um, we've used quite often, like there's a faction that will use disaster to take advantage of that situation and privatize things. She calls it disaster capitalism, but she's talking about now um, and was talking about early in the pandemic, the, uh, that we actually have an opportunity for, for actually reforming the way that we're approaching capitalism to make these things less painful for um, the end user, for the consumer, um, why are we stuffing people in planes that way? What's what's the problem with the 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 airline business model? Is there a different way to approach travel that isn't um, that doesn't rely on all of the terrible practices that airlines? We need the you know uh, I commute from Saskatchewan to Saskatoon. I can't drive between Friday and Monday and come back and forth. So our country is very big. We need planes, but we do need to be thinking about other ways to move and how much we need to move. Like lots of companies will be doing things by Zoom for a long time. Yeah. And well, so there's that, there's that, I think, environmental impact Mm -hmm. of less jumping on planes um, is going to um, be positive. Yeah. And also, I, I mean, didn't Alberta just uh, announce for 2025 the first uh, ultra high speed um, commuter train between Calgary and Edmonton, I guess that's yeah. going to take a half an hour. Those well, of us who I mean, commute for a living have been begging for train travel and no government right. has stood up. Right. Yeah. And so this may this may this is another potential accelerator here is, you know, we may be able to use this time to accelerate those more uh, sustainable forms of travel, the implementation there, because we have no choice. The other thing that uh, that I've noticed, even on a simple notion, and this should have been doable long before, is telehealth. I phone, Mm. uh, you know, 811 and and book an appointment to get my covid test before I get on a plane and then I and and the next day they say go here go there at this time instead of me getting into a car and going to a doctor's office and taking a day off work and, like we should be able to do some of these things pretty pretty quickly yeah absolutely i mean the uh, I have always wondered why do I need to actually go physically into my doctor's office just to have a quick conversation about refilling a prescription? Right. Um, I understand a physical exam needs to be in person, or if there are, if you have symptoms that need to be diagnosed in person that require temperature taking, blood pressure, right. that sort of thing. But why? Why does every? Why do you have to go sit in a in a doctor's waiting room to just right. be told, okay, here's another piece of paper for you? <laughs> this is all in terms of the products that can think about this, and I have to ask this. So, what happens in this world, or any, you know, even in a post-COVID world, when your product is a politician? Because uh, you've done that. Uh, you were the social and audience development strategic thinker for Justin Trudeau uh, when he ran for leader. And then uh, the same um, rules applied when he was running for prime minister. So what's different about that? 
Well, um, you can take a look at leaders, uh, politicians who have fared well and not fared not so well around the world during this pandemic um, to see that using social platforms in a way that listens, we talked about this earlier on, and communicates mm -hmm. uh, clearly and, you know, at the level to people, um, honestly, openly, uh, with humility, those leaders are faring much better during the pandemic. You look at um, uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister, for mm -hmm. instance, uh, she is using social very positively and her platform very positively to connect with people, to listen to people. Um, and we're going to see a lot more um, leaders come out the other side of this uh, successfully who are spending that time to use social platforms to listen and respond um, in real time as well. And the same thing applies to a politician as a as a product. If you start to use it as self promotion instead of self connection, people are gonna say, "Hold the phone here. That's not working for me." Yeah, no. I mean, right now it seems very tone deaf for anybody mm -hmm. to be pushing out their message, while people are looking for specific answers and help. Yeah, and help. Yeah. The whole notion of this and and I, I watched a TED talk that you gave in uh, at Concordia years ago you had a, a very different color hair then all of that kind of stuff we've all changed our looks now haven't we uh, yeah. and you talked about the need to be almost delusional that you have to be audacious that you have to go out and and just you know just risk it when when it, it seems, you know, you got to be prepared to live in your car, I think is what you said. If you care about doing a, a creating a genuine entrepreneurial new idea, taking us from point A to point B, is it, yeah. you still believe that? <laughs> well, uh, what I would say is that came from a place of necessity. Um, but since then, and during COVID and the conversations that have come up that have really led me to question my like belief in the almighty entrepreneurial <laughs> like hustle, uh, you know, that has all been called into question because mm -hmm. I see the terrible in inequalities that um, are built into the capitalist system we're part of. Now in Canada, we fare better than in the US. We have a certain amount of wonderful social structure, a healthcare system that actually, you know, maybe weren't perfect in our response to COVID. But if we look to our neighbors to the South, in mm -hmm. comparison, we were like golden. Um, and then, you know, like I could go and get a test in a half an hour for free and not have to worry about that. I don't have to worry about, you know, having, you know, losing everything if I get sick. And uh, as a business owner, like I have a great uh, amount of support uh, in and around me uh, in Canada. So a lot of businesses were able to weather that first three, four months and are able to now come back from it. Not, of course, not all of them, but I, I'm sure if we compare what's happened what's going to happen in the US long term with what's happened in what's happening in Canada it's going to we're going to see a better recovery on our end of things and so all of this I don't know if we'll be able to rec re afford it but we may have it well, but, uh, but we can't we can't not afford it my mm -hmm. you know like why can't we afford this is the big question that I'm having now and I think a lot of people are having now is like wait 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 Okay, how how come we can if we live in a world of abundance, but it's abundance for some and not for all? How do we change it so that like the rising tide brings up all boats instead of like only a few boats and the other boats like get you know sink further and further down? And that's also something I think that's a conversation that's accelerating right now during the pandemic that is giving me a lot of hope um, to hear people question like 
Huh, wait, so why, why is it that, um, uh, you know, wealth, you know, more wealth is created um, for uh, this sort of, um, what do they call it? The, like the rental, the class, the mm. class of wealth that is uh, rent seeking versus the, the, the producing class, right. you know, that's like economic term about like people who are like, the investors, et cetera, they're making way more money. People that invest make more money than people that do and create and make. Why is that going on? Why do we still have so much inequality? If there's meritocracy, why is there so But, but even in your inequality? own world, you've got Jeff Bezos or Zuckerberg uh, or where the where the extremes oh. are extreme. Oh, totally extreme. You got Bezos. <laughs> The uh, world's richest man, yeah. and um, yeah, certainly first guy they, to hit two hundred billion. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And they gave and they gave a, a raise to their workers because they're essential workers. But even that, like, he's still raking in the mm -hmm. in the bucks, and he still has a ton of people living on minimum wage who any minute now could get sick and lose anything. They're a paycheck or two away from losing their their homes right um that that does he need to put more money like how much money do you need um at the end of the day and I, you know um if my parents listen to this which i'm sure they will they're gonna be like <laughs> oh my we raise it should they're albertan we raise <laughs> socialists um but you know like but it's it's really about you know who who capitalism is supposed to have this invisible hand it's supposed to benefit everybody but um you know we're seeing a discussion that's like oh no this isn't how it's supposed to work mm -hmm. so i'm hopeful i guess i i I've, it's the idealism that i hold on to <laughs> it's helping me through the dark these dark times i guess so we all need a bit of that it's just been great talking to you and we will uh we'll be back we'll we'll, we'll be phoning you again to see if we can carry on these conversations. We're going to need to have many of them in the next few months. So nice. Nice to meet you, Tara. Nice to meet you. I think your parents too. will be proud, by the way. So don't worry about that. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> All right. Tara Hunt, thanks for joining us. Bye-bye now.